All right, we are good. Hey, everybody. This is Tanya Herman Fowler, American Pie THF. And today um, I am joined, joined <laughs> uh, by the lovely Allison Price. Uh, Allison has been a uh, mentor of mine when it comes to a um, health and wellness lifestyle. Um, she was probably another uh, part of my pie of putting those pieces together um, when you want to live a whole healthy lifestyle picture instead of just pieces parts. Um, and we've been, oh my gosh, how long have we been friends? It's been a while now. It's I kind know. of crazy. I know it's been a really, really long time. And so we've seen some highs and lows in the health and wellness industry, obviously. And um, we've decided to put our heads together here um, on these videos to create a series that uh, we think we'd like to call self-sufficient uh, sustainability, triple S. Yeah. Yes. And um, we're making a commitment to get at least one of these up uh, a week, maybe two a week, and go through a series of topics to kind of help people navigate um, better living right now during these uh, uncertain times. And the things that we have to share, I think, would be great anytime, period. They, you know, they were great things to be doing prior to this, but sometimes we need a reminder, a refresher. Or if you're new to being more self-sufficient and sustainable, um, just some ideas of places you could start. And uh, we don't want it to overwhelm people. You don't have to do everything at once. We sure the hell didn't, right? No. Um, so we just want to kind of uh, drop some things in here that maybe people can consider and um, help make uh, their lives a little more sustainable. So Allison, why don't you tell us a little bit about how your self-sustaining, self-sufficient sustainability lifestyle and wellness started? Well, I think it was just something that I've always been interested in. Um, my husband and I live on six acres. And when we bought this property, it was our, our first house. And I just kind of knew from the get-go, like, this is what I wanted. I wanted space to have my animals and have a garden. I grew up with my mom having a garden. Um, my husband grew up with a lot of his family members, his grandparents gardening. And so it's funny when you look back to see how it's evolved over time. Um, but really, you know, it kind of started with like, okay, so now I live in my own house. I'm on my own and I'm pretty sure cleaning supplies are not good for you, but I don't know why I feel like that. It's just, you know, my intuition setting off that alarm. And so I started to dabble uh, with essential oils and how can I make my own? And then that snowballed into so many things. And then like with the garden, you know, it's like, okay, well, I'm growing a garden now. What am I going to do with all this food? And there was just always that innate, um, you know, just thought process, like, well, we can't waste it all. And, you know, so how, how, what am I going to do with this? And I, I just, it's, it's snowballed over the years to get me to where I am now. It's interesting because I find myself looking back through, you know, old books and notes and um, things like that from grandparents and great grandparents. And then, you know, over the last two years, it's really spiraled into this isn't just a hobby anymore. You know, this, this is a priority. These are things that, you know, it's not, if I get to it, it's, I'm going to get to this. So I've got some tomatoes sitting right behind my computer screen right now, ripening. And in years past, it may have been, well, if I don't get to them, I'll throw them to the chickens. No, I'm going to get to them, you know, or the pears that are falling off the tree outside. We're going to get to those. And so it's, it's a hobby, it's an interest, but it's also a, a lifestyle. It's really evolved into that. So I guess, you know, looking for this piece of property way back when, 15 years ago, when everybody said, you're crazy, buy a, just buy a little starter house and you move on from there. And I was like, why am I always the crazy one? Because I'm always going against the grain, but you know, there was something to that because here we are and it's working out just fine for us, so. That, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to ask you, I don't know you and your husband's backstory. I mean, I've been out to your property, which is beautiful and amazing and got a lot of great things going on. So it was your, it wasn't like a, 
starter home and you've dabbled in some of this and thought we need something bigger, you guys just went ahead and jumped and yeah. We went and feet first. I mean, I think it probably took us two years to find this property. And I, I specifically remember certain people in my life, some of who have since been cut out of my life, saying things to me like, oh, you know, you're crazy. And just, you know, you need to find a starter house. And nobody starts off with the house that they want to live in for the rest of their lives. I mean, could I upgrade where from where I'm at now? Yeah, sure. But do I need to? No, not really. And I don't need any more square footage to be cleaning because Lord knows I don't even get to clean what I got now. So <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, I, I, we looked at this as a long-term thing. We never looked at it as, you know, we're going to stay here for five years. It was, this is what we got now. How are we going to make it work? So, so saying that, you know, a lot of us, especially women, and if you're in a relationship and, you know, and a lot of times I feel then this is my experience women are more open or intuitive to this whole idea of a great way to um, take care of your family and, and all the rest of it. And sometimes we have to kick, bring the husbands along kicking and screaming or they're, so are you was your husband on board with this or you had to be like, let's do this and it'll be okay. It depends what category we're talking about. For everything outside, he's 110% on board. But when it comes to mostly more of the proactive well care in our house, I mean, he 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 went along with it. Um, but, you know, there's certain times, especially when he's not feeling well with, you know, he's got the man cold going on and Lord knows, you know, you got a man cold, you better call in reinforcements and, you know, whatever kind of injectable is going to make them feel 110% in five minutes is what you are going to do, regardless of what is in there. So sometimes it takes a little coaxing, even to this day, you know, we have children now. And so when they're sick, nobody wants to see their children sick. And so he tends to get a little like, oh my God, oh my God, you know, and I'm like, just have faith, you know, what we're doing and using is proven time and time again to work. But sometimes that instant gratification that society has ingrained into our brains, you know, kind of takes over for him. So every now and again, we got to do a little bit of coaxing there with that. This year, he was getting super frustrated with our cabbage and was begging me, like, can I just dust it one time with, you know, chemicals? And I'm like, it's like, you don't even know me. What, what are you even asking me right now? No, you may not. No, you may not. <laughs> so, you know, once, once in a while, those things slip in. I got to pull them back into reality and say, no, damn it. We're going to eat cabbage with moth holes in it, okay? Because I am not sprinkling it with chemicals, so... But for the most part, like that meme that, that meme that that meme that we shared on Facebook the other day about, you know, find yourself a husband that's like, well, you brought home a pack of alpacas. This is super inconvenient for me, but I'll go get started on the fence. That's most it. days, that's who I'm living with. So that's good. Yeah. Good, <laughs> good. Yeah, same, same here. I've had to bring my husband along. Um, I don't even think he wanted, and we don't even remotely live on this, the space that you do. And we definitely were not. Um as attached to a wellness lifestyle as we were when we married 20 years ago. Um, and I've had to kind of coax him, but he is definitely of that same mindset of the supportive. Um, and then once the initial supportive is there, he actually yeah. begins to see the benefit of some of the choices, all the choices sure. we've, we've, we've made. So yeah, definitely. Um, and I've said this a couple of times, in the past couple of years to people, I cannot imagine what I've gone through in my own home or witnessed in the past two and a half years to be in a home, whether it's a, a partner, a spouse, children, roommate, okay. I don't care. Um, and you weren't on the same page. I couldn't on, yeah, I couldn't. I really okay. couldn't. And, it's hard you know, enough did, as it is. I couldn't imagine you know, walking through all of that and then being at odds with the person you're laying down next to at night. Like, mm -hmm. I just don't know how that. I just, nope. yeah. Absolutely not. We know a few and yeah. I don't know how they're managing. I, and unfortunately, I think I've heard of a few that during this time they did step, you know, divorce. I don't know if it was so much about 
not agreeing on these topics, but I guess the stress that all of these past sure. couple years brought into a household, they finally decided this was their breaking point. I don't know what, yeah. a, what a terrible time to be going. It's not a great time yeah, anytime, but then add that on top of, yeah. 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 That's, I can't imagine. No, I cannot. So those, those kind of things, I guess we definitely will be counting our blessing um, for very much. Yes, so. for sure. As much as we want to go. I know. <laughs> Yeah. Listen to me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Why do we have to keep having this discussion? <sighs> yeah. So, um, I, because, um, like I said, Allison has been much more a mentor and, um, a go-to person for me on a lot of these topics. Um, I'm going to let, I'm going to ask her a couple questions today to kickstart our topic. Number one of self-sufficient sustainability. And today we decided, um, it could be an important time to look at food sourcing, uh, where our food comes from, how we might uh, go about finding more local, uh, more organic, or at least know where the hell it's coming from. Right. Um, we've had a lot of conversations lately, and I have, it's funny, the universe, we have these conversations, and then you watch a, a television show where people are asked a question about their food, and they're like, well, I get it at the grocery store, I get it at the grocery store. They, the concept of how it actually gets to the grocery store is right. Yeah, it, it's um, uh, it takes people a moment to understand that it doesn't it's, just, I don't know what, what they think, but that's just their thought on their food. And I think with time now, we're definitely finding hello there, <laughs> how are you feeling? He, oh. he couldn't resist. <laughs> Well, at least he was like a silent assassin. He just kind of <laughs> came in quietly. The worst. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, go ahead. I'll just be petting my hound dog. Right All right, saying. there you go. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we're definitely finding out. I think we knew it wasn't good for, it wasn't great for us. Yeah. But now there's stuff out there that in some cases it might've intentionally been put out for us to not yeah. be good for us to yeah. be a, um, a slow killer, if you will. I know that sounds terrible, like hard. No, I think that's it's very true. accurate. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very, very truthful. Um, so um, have you always, um, I mean, I know you enjoyed having the acreage and growing things in that, but tell us about kind of how your journey of food sourcing, came for me yeah. start from the beginning. So I think my bit, I've always been a little bit of a food snob. I, um, you know, growing up in high school and college, I worked at a fine dining restaurant. And so that really opened my eyes to, you know, cuisine and what's out there. And I've always been interested in cooking. I enjoy it. Um, and I think my biggest aha moment, honestly, I know it's cliche, but it was when I had my first child because all of a sudden it's like, I, I think it was probably maybe even a little bit before I had him somewhere in that two year span of when we got married, we moved in, I started, you know, do I'm preparing all our meals. Um, but then when I had a baby, it was like, wow, what is in this food? And so that's when I really started learning and researching and learning about the foods that you're buying at the grocery stores and how you know, you may think they're good for you. That's food marketing at its finest. And I always say I have a degree in marketing, so I'm allowed to bash the That's marketing nice. industry because I know what they're doing. And it's, you know, I did years of research. I used to write a blog and it was just kind of um, unveiling all the things I was finding out about, like um, CAFO, which are the controlled feedlot operations for cows and, you know, how they're really, um, you know, we talk farm to table is a term that we hear a lot nowadays. Um, so I guess if you will, learning about what farm to table means when you're buying conventional grocery store meat. And so I just really started to learn about more about processed foods and the garbage that's in your foods and how you're supposed to shop the perimeter of the grocery store where everything ha actually has an expiration date that's like a week out, not two years down the road. And so that kind of really catapulted everything for me. And then that coupled on top of having a garden and growing our own food. And it, it's, um, 
you know, I really, um, that's what I'm looking for. I really curated our palettes, if you will, because, you know, you, you could give me a bag of Doritos back in the day and I put that bad boy back like it was amazing. And now it's like, uh, you know, I'm not going to say I never have them, but here and there on a whim when we have something like that, the, the taste to me yeah. is just like, what was I, what was I doing? What was I thinking? It just tastes like a piece of plastic or chemicals. And so, um, that really opened my eyes and I, I really just became so passionate about learning about it and, and sharing that information with others and, you know, then you throw the gardening aspect into it. And you hear people say all the time, you don't know what a tomato tastes like until you taste a ripe tomato pick straight out of the garden. And I don't think, I mean, I know people don't realize that the, the tomatoes you buy in the grocery store, you know, they're shipped from like, we're here in Ohio. So a lot of our stuff's coming from the other side of the country, especially if you're eating things that aren't even in season right now, that I'm, I'm, I could go off in 20 tangents, but that's like a whole nother thing. You know, like, do people even understand what eating in season means? I mean, you, you should not, I do not buy oranges this time of year. I just don't because they're not going to taste good. And mm. people, you know, it, 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 ugh, it kills me when people are like, oh my God, I'm returning this bag of oranges. They're horrible. Well, Karen, it's August in Ohio, it's not citrus season. Um, and when you do want citrus, you are, that is something where you are going to have to, that's going to have to get shipped to you. You know, you can't get citrus in Ohio, fresh citrus, but if you are ordering from a farmer out of Florida or something, you're going to get, you know, as fresh as you can get, but it's not going to be the same thing in August or in September. So, um, learning to eat seasonally was a big thing for me. And then understanding how that also affects our bodies and our wellness. You know, there's a reason why we crave soups and stews and warm foods in the winter versus why we want greens and, and lettuce and, you know, fresh tomatoes in the summer. There's, there's a biological factor there too. So I don't even remember what your initial question was, but I could just keep going and going. I mean, um, when you really start looking at where your food comes from and you start to curate your palate, if you will, and you learn what a real tomato tastes like versus a tomato in the grocery store that's been bred to withstand traveling across the country and still look ripe and still look fresh and, you know, not dented. I mean, shoot, my tomatoes from the backyard to the kitchen look like they've been through hell in a handbasket sometimes. So I can't imagine how these pristine tomatoes from California make it to Ohio, you know, looking like a blue ribbon tomato because they're just perfect in every way. That's just, that is the reality we've been taught to accept, but that is not reality. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Boy, that goes with a lot of topics. Um, yeah. But no, I think you really, you, you did answer the question, which originally was what took you down? Like, when did you start the whole food sourcing yeah. journey? Yeah. Um, and so I know from being around you and being to your property, yes, you grow amazing uh, fruits and vegetables, but you are not um, doing dairy or meat or anything like that on your property. So where do you feel that, you know, where does somebody start or where did you start when you wanted to get those things somewhere else? So farmers markets were kind of like one of my first starting points with that. We were actually attending them as a vendor for our apples. And then that's when I really got to know just other local farmers in the area. Um, somewhere down the line, I discovered the website called localharvest.org, which is still in existence. And it's a great place to seek out. I mean, now we're talking like 12, 13 years ago when you weren't driving down the road and seeing signs everywhere, fresh eggs, you know, chickens for sale. I feel like you, we're seeing that more now in the past two years than we ever have, but that's also a little bit more common where I live too. Um, you know, I'm not in as populated a, of an area. You know, if you go to a city, you're not gonna see that as much. So then, um, you know, for me, it was also about, so sourcing out other local 
farmers that maybe they're doing meat birds and they're going to sell some of them. Um, maybe they have a dairy cow and they're selling some milk or, you know, a herd share. Um, but it was also, if I couldn't find it from somebody like that locally, it was looking for the establishments that aren't just part of the conglomerate go grocery store chains that are going to provide you uh, with the food that you're looking for. So in my area specifically back in the day, there was two, uh, if you will, grocery stores, I guess that they would call more of like a health food type of grocery store. And so I would go to those stores and look at the meat that they were offering. And I, I remember, I'm like, I literally was that person calling their corporate office. And I'm like, all right, so this meat here says that it's grass fed. Tell me about this meat. Where are you sourcing it from? You know, where are you getting it from? Um, but it was, it was, you know, just kind of doing my homework and I hate to say it, I know Walmart is a big convenience for people, but it's not a convenience for your health. And if you're buying any kind of meat from Walmart, I don't care what the label says. The label can tell you whatever they want. That doesn't mean that it's true. Just because it says grass fed, you know, that that doesn't mean anything. You've got to dig a little bit deeper. And so I took a lot of time researching, you know, farmers in the area stores that were maybe a little bit smaller scale. And so maybe I was paying a little bit more for that quality food, but newsflash, when you eat quality food and not empty calories, it might cost you more up front, but you're not going to eat as much because you're, you're satiated, you're nourished, you're full, you know, you, you're, um, I don't know, your frozen pizza may cost a fraction of what that nice, chunk of grass-fed beef cost, but that grass-fed beef is going to nourish you, going to keep you fuller, longer. You may get three meals out of it. That frozen pizza might only cost you two bucks, but you're going to be hungry again in an hour and you've gotten no nourishment from it. So it's just a lot of just looking around what's around me, what's available to me, what farmers are in my area. And again, the local harvest website was very, um, very helpful with that. Attending local farmers markets because you're going to meet a lot of local people in your area that way. Um, and then the grocery stores, you know, seeking out. Um, I live in a small town, so we do have a smaller chain grocery store in our area. And from time to time, they will bring in locally sourced fruits and veggies and not really so much meats. I think their hands are a little bit more tied there with, you know, USDA regulations and whatnot. But just learning where, you know, where can you find the people that can provide for you what you can't provide for yourself? And it takes a little bit of legwork at first, but right. buying clubs are another thing. I learned about buying clubs and I, I set up to be a host for one. And so what that was, was a farmer in the area that would come to our house uh, like once a week, twice a month. I don't remember what schedule we were on, but I had to get so many families who then would each go through their menu of what they had available for the next week. And they would order what they wanted, like bacon, burgers, roasts, steaks, what, whatever they were offering. And then they would drive to our house with coolers. Everything was frozen and everybody picked up at our location, you know, twice a month or whatever that was. And so we did that for at least a good year with a local farmer that offered that as an option. Wow. That's, so, that's, that's yeah. cool. There's, yeah, it is really cool. And there's, there's those options out there, but you know, these are all people doing this because they love it, but also because they need to make a living and they can't afford to be advertising this to us, you know, like, and most of the time they're busy doing their, doing their thing. You know, they're busy out there tending to their animals, tending to their crops. They don't have the luxury of sitting behind a computer and learning social media and figuring out how to market to us. So when you get those, you know, opportunities to get in front of them at a farmer's market, or you come across them and there's a buying club option, and then that helps spread the word about them. I mean, this is small scales, grassroots marketing at its finest, but honestly, it's, I love it. It's, I, I, I would go to somebody any day of the week that does not have the means to advertise their product to me versus a box store or somebody who's shoving it down my throat on the tube or anything like that. No, absolutely. Um, I have a question. Um, the localharvest.org. Now, did that 
site just provides you with sources local to us here in the state of Ohio, or everywhere. is that everywhere? Wow. Yeah. Wow. All over the country. So I, I believe if I remember correctly, you can search by your zip code. You can kind of search for if there's a certain thing that you're looking for, you can, you know, you're looking for grapes or you're looking for raw dairy or whatever. You can filter your search by that. But yeah, it's all over. So, you know, if you go on vacation somewhere and you need to stock up the fridge in the cabin for a week, pull up your local harvest before you get there, see who's in your area, what's in your area. Um, you know, and then all of the farm profiles will put up. Now, granted, somebody has to make that profile, whether it's the farmer or some, you know, somebody helping them with something. So you're always going to run into, you know, somebody might not be on that website, but I feel like I discovered it over a decade ago and it's, it's still, you know, still, still there today. So people are still utilizing it. It's a really good resource. Wow. That is, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize that. That's really cool. Yeah. Really, really cool. So the other thing that um, you do that interests me, and it's something me and my husband are considering. Um, okay, so I know, like I said, I know you don't have dairy or meat, cattle or pigs or whatever. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, I know. I'm. I know. I'm waiting for you there. <laughs> but um, chickens, you do it. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people, I think, think that's a gigantic undertaking, and you have told me maybe not so much. So no, we have forty chickens right now, and people are like, yeah. forty chicken. I I I don't even realize we have forty chickens. It's just, I mean, and they're in various stages. Some of them are older; they're not laying eggs as much. Some of them are babies; they're not yet laying. Um, honestly. And so anybody who knows me knows I am not a fan of things with feathers. It's not that I dislike them. I just don't want them touching me. I don't want them fluttering their feathers around my head. So you stay in your coop. I'll come check out your eggs. You know, keep your distance. We're good. I had one in my horse stall the other day that got loose and I she scared the ever living shit out of me and I was screaming and I'm thinking like, oh my God, somebody's going to think something bad's happening here. Anyways. So my husband does most of the care as far as cleaning the chickens. Um, I'll go in there and give them their grain and stuff, but no, I mean, they are the least amount of work. Anybody can make anything be a lot of work, right? When we see these like castle chicken coops with chandeliers hanging in them, which chickens are dirty and disgusting. I don't know how you have a chandelier hanging in your coop because I'm going to tell you after two days, the dander on that chandelier is going to be like this. It is not, it is not country living magazine. Let me tell you. But as far as the care, no, they are so easy. I've got dogs, I've got cats, I've got horses, I've got chickens. They are the least maintenance ever, ever, least maintenance. Make sure they have fresh water every day, make sure they get fed every day, collect their eggs every day. And then depending how your setup is, you may be cleaning your coop more often than other people. Um, our chickens have big areas to roam outdoors and they have a dirt floor coop. So in the winter, we can let that build up a little bit because it creates heat to help keep them warm. And then we'll just layer it with straw or more shavings. So we usually have like twice a year where there's a really big clean out. And when I say we, I mean, my husband, you know, he goes in there with the wheelbarrow and he, you know, shoveling out a couple barrels worth, but, um, that just goes into the garden. And so it's regenerate, regenerative farming at its finest. And they provide us with eggs every day, which is amazing. I mean, what a versatile food to have access to, you know? So well, I figure, yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you could probably live off eggs if something happened for, you know, yeah. a protein source, a, a sustainability, calorie. So you you tapped on that regenerative farming. And so, you know, correct me if I'm wrong or not. So you can use their waste as fertilizer for the garden. Yep. And then the other side of that is if you have food waste, you could feed it to the chickens. Absolutely. Right? Food waste goes to the chickens. Um, also, when our gardens are done for the season, we open those areas up to the chickens for them to get in there and scratch and turn th turn the soil a little bit for us, you know, leave a little bit of a gift behind, and, you know, just keeps regenerating that soil. But 
gosh, I wish I could remember what the actual statistic was. I don't, I'll have to go back and listen and I'll send it to you. But I was listening to something recently and there was a village, I want to say maybe in Sweden, something somewhere where they were offering, the government was offering every um, family three chickens. And the amount of the reduction of waste because they were feeding their, their kitchen scraps to the chicken had cut back immensely in this little town. And then they went through like the whole thing about, you know, the chickens can eat the kitchen scraps. And then, you know, you're getting eggs from that. And it, it was just a really like a, wow, that's amazing when you really break it down like that. So I'll find what the actual statistic was. But one of the huge takeaways was the amount of waste reduction because people were giving their, you know, every time I clean out the fridge, all the leftovers go out to the chicken. Yesterday I was canning and um, all the scraps as I, you know, poured my tomatoes and stuff like that, that all goes out to the chickens. None of that, you know, I, I, I can do a compost pile too. And I, I do, but I kind of fail at it because a lot of my scraps go to the chickens. So, so you don't have to buy chicken food. Well, I do, but I mean, there are times of year when they will eat less because they're out right now in the grass. They're eating bugs and grubs and mice. People don't realize that they, they are carnivores. They are going to eat if it scurries in front of them, snakes, mice, any of that, they're going to eat it. But, you know, between all of that outside, when the weather's nice, coupled with my kitchen scraps, there's definitely the ability to cut back on the amount of actual feed that we have to give to them. Wow. Wow. That is, yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. That's something yeah, so that's that like, that's like a whole nother tangent. We could do a whole show on it, but like marketing and the egg industry, when people are paying extra money for these cartons and they say vegetarian fed, don't be paying extra for that because chickens are carnivores. There's, there's nothing exciting about a vegetarian fed chicken. They are not vegetarians. I promise you. <laughs> good point. Yeah. A very, very good point. Um, so there was something that you said I wanted to, uh, to touch base back on there about, oh, oh, I know what it was. I've watched you, especially this season, um, which I think is great. And so, you know, you can tell us a little bit, maybe there's somebody else out there like you that didn't have this idea or how it was received. Um, when you were doing like your extra little seedlings or you have extra veggies in your garden or extra eggs and <laughs> trust me, at a better price than I can buy them at the store, you kind of had a little market out front of yeah. your property. So tell yeah. me about that. Yeah. So once I've got an abundance of things and I don't necessarily need to do anything with them, I've canned enough of it or whatever, we just set a little market stand out front and it's very well received. Like you said, I mean, much less expensive than what you're going to find at the grocery store. I mean, I think my husband harps on me daily that I'm, I might as well give the eggs away for free because th we charge three bucks a dozen and you can't even get disgusting anemic eggs from the grocery store for $3 a dozen anymore at this point. So people, I mean, people will seek out, you know, the, the trend, I don't know if that's the word I want to use, but the trend to move to more local food consumption is on the rise. And I, you know, I, my advertising is just word of mouth and literally throwing it up on the community Facebook page saying like, Hey, over here, I've got this out today, if anybody's interested. And honestly, now it's gotten to the point where people message me, what do you got this week? Can you put together whatever you got? I'll take a little bit of everything. And, you know, here I am showing up at my kids' sports events and I'm bringing, you know, little curated boxes of whatever's fresh this week, you know, herbs and tomatoes and eggs and squash. And I mean, just whatever I've got that I can put together and people are making use of it. And it's just, you know, I had one mom tell me, she's like, you literally saved my week because she's a single mom. She's working all day. She's running around. She's trying to figure out what to feed her kids. And one night it was, you know, scrambled eggs with some tomatoes on the side. And I think um, there was berries that week, some blackberries. So then they had some blackberries for dessert. And she's like, I would have never had time to run to the grocery store and buy something as nutritious as what I was able to do here. And for a fraction of the cost, honestly. So yeah, we've got some plans in the works to maybe have something a little bit more 
professional down at the end of, edge of the driveway instead of just a cooler and a table, you know, something to shade from the sun and that kind of things that I can leave out all day long. But I, I enjoy it. And, you know, the seedlings in the spring when I've got more than what I need, you know, I was, people were purchasing some of my seedlings and again, that's a whole nother topic we can chat about, but I'm real particular about what I grow. I want, you know, organic seeds. I want definitely non-GMO seeds. I don't want any of this, you know, Franken crop stuff coming into my yard. I've spent many years being real, you know, methodical about that. I do a lot of heirloom seeds. And so the beauty of that too, the fun thing about it is you can grow some really unique stuff that you're never going to find in a grocery store. You're never going to find it in a grocery store. So that's always a fun little perk. Yeah, I've been very um, surprised, I guess, you know, living in Ohio that what we can grow and even sometimes run several harvests of it if you do the succession planting type thing. Huh? And so, yeah, that's been very, I, I guess I'm just surprised. You just think about, I love Ohio and I've really grown to appreciate it much, much more as I've gotten older. When I was a kid, be like, Ohio, it's boring. Yeah. But now I feel like it might be one of the best places to be for, for a whole bunch of reasons. But yeah, yeah. our growing season here really is not terrible at That's all. That's super long. I feel like, you know, you go further south and you have a longer growing season or you can really grow all year long. And you can get a little bit burnt out. I mean, I don't know. I'm just assuming that's probably how I would feel. You know, there comes a point where I'm happy to put the gardens to bed for winter and, you know, just kind of hibernate and plan for next year and, you know, source out other people that have things I need that I don't have right now and then live off of what we've preserved and saved and stored. And, you know, if it was a constant 365 days a year of production in the gardens, that that would be very tiring. <laughs> I would agree with you because this is my first year of uh, not gardening, but it grew from, you know, a, a big 10 foot planter box to now it's outside of the planter box and it's in this corner and, and, and all of that. And every day I was out there twice a day, yeah. watering, harvesting, taking off little dead things. I put yeah. I put fresh cardboard under my big fruit to keep it off the ground and you got to yeah. replace that. Um, so the days that it rains or something like that, now that we're in August, end of August, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're sitting on the porch with a glass of wine, like, yeah, you water the garden today. That's Thank right. you. <laughs> yeah. At first you're like, I got to get out and water. I got to get out and do this. And then as that, you know, three, four months goes by, you're like, okay. Yeah. I'm real methodical about the tomato plants in the beginning, like any sign of blight on a leaf and I'm out there picking and pruning. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, just give me the last of what you got. And I'm ripping you out. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I understand that so, so much. So, um, I'm going to come at this, um, way different than Allison because I'm, I don't live in the same community that she does not that I don't have access to that but um, even for me to come and visit her is a bit of a drive and um, we all know now you know you got to watch your gas prices right um, but so locally for me um, I have found a few other farms kind of that you can do meat uh, locally and you don't have to buy at the grocery store so you know that um, there's one in Hartville that I know for a fact, she uses a lot of, uh, this is Harmon Creek Farm. She uses, because I forget what the um, method is, and you might know this better. She's actually studied with this person or went to their farm in Virginia, I think. Oh, Joel they, Salton. Where they do a lot of essential oils in the cows, oh. all the farm animals food. And oh, that's cool. Yeah. So they're, they're naturally providing them with, you know, instead of antibiotics and hormones, they're yeah. using more natural plant-based product inside their feed to yeah. produce, you know, a different kind. So uh, that, and I also have um, another place nearby me that I've discovered in the last couple of months. Um, it's called uh, Hartville Seafood and Meat Company, and they're products come from a farm in Hartville again, but they have a, a storefront here in Jackson Township. 
If anybody is familiar with the whole Nom Nom popcorn family, I believe it's the same darn people. They're, oh, good. Real, they're real entrepreneurs, I have to tell you. They own a whole plaza near wow. me and they have a hot dog place, a fine dining restaurant, a meat market, a popcorn place, a cup Dang. place. Yeah, I know. So everything you want all in one place. And um, their meat in that they make their own beef jerky. Um, it seems like if they have some excess of something, they're marinating in some uh, local marinades. Uh, I see a lot of Amish based or Southern Ohio based products in their store. That's all they have. Um, Very cool. And if they have some excess of some mushrooms, which I am assuming are coming from that garden, they might make some stuffed mushrooms and they sell them. Yeah, things like that. So um, that's something that I've been leaning into instead of my uh, traditional grocery store. Don't get me wrong. Occasionally I too have to go, but again, I'm even choosing. Yeah. I don't go to a giant Eagle. I definitely don't go to a Walmart and I can give you a list of reasons as to why that would be. Uh, um, no, I don't, you know, I think a lot of times too, people say, well, I shop at this store because it gives me these perks. And what you have to understand is you're paying for those perks, okay? You right. Just are. The, the prices are going to be raised. Nobody's giving you this stuff out of the goodness, you know, just like no. a lot of people like a credit card that gives them airline miles. Um, yeah, you're paying for those in your interest right. rates or um, as a business owner with a had a brick and mortar, I began to find out that I was paying for those credit cards in my credit card processing fees. So I was paying for my customers to be able to have uh, cash back or airline miles, not the credit card company. The yeah. business are. So if the businesses have to cover that in credit card fees, they're going to raise the prices of their services, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you're going to get so many dollars off on gas or back on your groceries, trust me, you're, pay you're, you're paying for that. Somewhere, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm very much more, I want a smaller market that might bring in some local produce, things like that. And the other things that I have personally found that were necessary two and a half years ago, and I have continued to do, because like I said, I, I think it gets rid of my, I was probably a bad impulse buyer. Anytime I walked into a store, you yeah. would go in with a list of things or an intention and you could walk out with a ton of crap. If you went in hungry, if you, whatever, oh, yeah. Um, this is on sale. Well, I don't need it, but it's on sale. It's on it's, sale. Yeah, you would load up on this stuff. So yeah. I really did begin to enjoy some of the uh, door delivery type services. Um, first of all, I was not going into a grocery store. I didn't do a compliant face diaper type thing. Um, I couldn't look at other people that were choosing to do that. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I wanted to grocery shop. I didn't want to go in and have confrontation or have weird looks. Um, right. It saved me money by yeah. finding places that would ship right to my door. And two of the companies that I use weekly that I think are really awesome. One is Misfits. Okay. I've the heard of them. Reason, yeah. The reason I enjoy them is that you can get fruits, vegetables, pantry items, a lot of unusual things that you probably won't find on your local grocery, grocery yeah. store. Um, they have a ton of organics mm -hmm. and their mission is to rescue fruits and vegetables that the, you know, the ones that aren't so perfect that the grocery right. store will flat out throw away if they oh, don't yeah. look a certain way. Yeah. And so they go and rescue, they take all this from grocery stores that won't use them and then they will box them and you you know and ship them off and I just got a misfits order today before we got on this call so they do things like that which I think is really awesome they have added a cold section to there so you can get organic milk oh. or um cream cheese sour cream um eggs meat they have meat uh, that's awesome. Like that. Yeah. So you can add that onto your order it, and you are picking and choosing. It's not like a surprise box. It was when I very first started it, you made a commitment to a small or large box at this price point or this price point. And you, it showed, it was kind of like Christmas because it showed up and you 
got whatever yeah. came, they were only doing fruits and vegetables then and so I didn't mind really because I'm like you I like to cook I like a little challenge I like creativity my palate's pretty broad I can come up with a lot of things throw it at me let's do it yeah um, and of course being shut in your house not going anywhere I was watching a lot of cooking shows so you right know, yeah it worked out so that uh, that's Misfits. And the other one that came into my purview that I use on the weekly also is Imperfect Foods. Again, oh, okay. they have organics and not organics. I feel that they don't have as many organic choices as Misfits does. Um, but again, they'll do things like rescue, let's say pistachios or pecans. Okay. So I don't know. My husband's in the transportation industry and he tells me sometimes that say you're, you're carrying a pallet full of pecans. Okay. For a company, who, whoever out there sells mass merchandising pecans. And if the shipment comes into the shipper and the box is smashed, the shipper, the, can the, the company can refuse that. That's okay. crazy. Yeah. So companies like imperfect and misfits then will take those, buy those products back from those at a discount, repackage them in their imperfect or misfits packaging. And it tells you on there, rescued pecan, you know, um, they even have, so I think this is the best. They have sausages that are kind of meat and plant based. And they'll say made with chicken and pork and ugly vegetables. And they make stuff. Hey, there you go. I think it's pretty cool. I think it goes into that whole uh, sustainability thing, which yeah. I'm more and more embracing. But so if you're not, if you don't have the land or the time to do your own growing, um, you don't live in a farming type community, you feel like that's too far away from you, you're not there yet, you have options if you live in yeah. a city to have those yep. kind of things dropped right on your doorstep. And what for sure. The buyer's club, stuff like that. I mean, I think those things have really become accessible to everybody. Yeah. Or, or and I feel like things. it can be intimidating for people sometimes too. You know, like you're trying to transition out of the societal norms of grocery stores where you're just kind of force fed everything. And now I'm telling you that you've got to go out, find a farmer, chat with them. Like I remember the first time my mom ordered a quarter cow because we're, I've been doing that for years now. And she was just like, beside, wait, what? I have to call the butcher, but what do I say? I said, he will walk you through everything. He's going to explain every cut, give you your options. Like but I get it because I was there too at one point, the first time I ever ordered it. And, you know, and the farmer's like, all right, this is what you owe me. Send me a check, go to the butcher. You owe him the processing fee and got to call your cuts in. And I'm like, what does that mean? You know? And so there is a learning curve and, you know, you've got different kinds of people. You got people who are going to persevere right through that and figure it out. And then you've got people who are like, whoa, I'm going to Walmart. I'm getting my meat off the shelf and I'm calling it a day. Like that is way too much, you know, too intimidating. So, you know, it's a process. Maybe you start with these companies like you've mentioned, and then depending where you live, you know, I mean, I live by a lot of Amish, so I just march right up to their door. Hey, what do you got? You know, like they've got signs that tells me everything they've got to offer right now. And then I've got to walk up there and I got to, you know, like wander around until somebody sees me and comes out and looks at me like, what are you doing here? Even though they're selling provisions and it's like, I'm here to buy, you know, it's just very awkward sometimes, but it doesn't bother me. Yeah. A lot of people would be like, no, thank you. I'm going to go to the grocery store. So there's a learning curve there. And great. Gosh, you know, like maybe, maybe that's like another idea. Like how do we help people through that learning curve of, you know, where do I start when I want to break up with the grocery store? <laughs> Wait, oh, what a, yeah, now that right there. That's, a, yeah, that's, just, that's, that's awesome. I love it. Me. <laughs> I like it. I'm but, writing it down. Right. Yes, there you go. But I think what, what you're saying there is, is um, to me, the start is, to pay attention, to read, to do a little research, to find some like-minded friends or family who are dabbling, if that's all they are, or and you know, starting to work with them. And I and and then I know there's probably 
Facebook communities, all kinds of, you know, ask. Yeah. 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 There's all kinds of. There was actually two books. I'm looking them up right now. Um, that back even before I had my first child, when I kind of got started on this whole regal food movement, um, there were a couple books that really, um, just, I was like, wow. Um, one of them was, they were by Michael Pollan. And I believe the one was in defense of food. And the other one was, uh, he's got a lot of books and I've read a lot of them, but I'm trying to think. Um, I think the other one was the omnivores dilemma. Those were probably the first two that I read. And then there was also, um, one more book by a different author. Uh, Her name was Nina, Nina. What was it? Real food, Nina. There it is. Um, Real Food, What to Eat and Why by Nina Plank, P-L-A-N-C-K. Let me see, I'll show you a picture. Oh, is it going to let me show you a picture? There it goes. Kind of, maybe. Food. I'll give you, I'll send these to you so you can put them in the notes. I put them in the notes, yeah. Yeah, one of them I read, and then I believe the other two I actually listened to as a book on tape when I would drive to work, and it was eye-opening for me. It was really, really an eye-opener to just transition out of that industrial food complex. And I think now, you know, and we've talked about this, you know, so many people, and and like, especially kids, you know, they're eating a chicken nugget. They don't, there's a chicken nugget that came out of the red bag that mom pulled out of the cooler at the store. Like they have no clue. And I thought about this the other day when my kids eat meat, they're like, so is this, did this come from a cow? Did it come from a pig, from a chicken? Like, what is it? You know, like last night I, we had pot roast and my daughter was like, so is that cow? Like what, what am I eating? You know, they, they're a little bit more aware and there's too many adults that aren't even aware you know, the, the impossible burger and all this plant-based burger garbage and stuff. People don't realize how much junk is in there. And they think that they're doing better for themselves by making their, those choices. And they're not. So those three books were uh, um, really big for eye-opening for me to really start to understand, know the difference, um, and, you know, real food. I mean, if it's got an ingredient label, you're not off to a great start, you know, but hopefully it's only got a few ingredients on it. Cause once it's this long, you're in trouble. Yeah. Well, you know, I say what you said, like impossible burger and beyond burger and things like that. The upside to that to me is at least those people are in the mindset for change or something different or the very good healthier al- alternative. So, yeah. um, yeah. That's a great point. Just like the same people that, you know, I know a few people that they're just like habitual. I'm on a diet. So everything's fat free and low fat. And I'm like, (laughs) if I have to explain to you one more time that that's worse, we're not friends anymore. Like just, you know, but you're right. They're in the mindset to make healthier decisions, but they just have to be aware of food marketing and what truly is a healthier decision. And those books for me, that, that opened up, you know, those probably catapulted a lot of my curiosity and just research over the years and learning about this kind of stuff, because the food marketing, the food industry is so deceiving from the, the industrial complex of it all, you know, and, um, just how we have gotten away from the victory gardens of the 1920s that our government was promoting that we do, to, you know, now heaven forbid you gas somebody out with your, you know, homemade, homegrown, you know, whatever business you're minding on your own land. So yeah, these, these are <laughs> yeah. too close to somebody else's. Back. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I heard some horror stories about that when I got my, started getting into bees about like some people just can't even keep them because their neighbors are like, oh my God, the bees. Did you know that they're, that's like nature, that, that, that happens naturally. I heard some somebody said the other day, in your yard, if you like, especially if you have a garden, if you're not seeing pests and bugs, then you're doing something wrong. Because if your yard is so toxic, 
that the bugs don't even want to be a part of it. That's a red flag. Wow. I mean, in, in, wow. in, in, in a in a perfect world, you're always going to have bugs, but you're also going, you're going to have good bugs and you're going to have bad bugs. So for every cabbage moth that I've got out there destroying my cabbage, I'm also cultivating an environment that's going to breed things that are going to just offer the process of natural selection of those cabbage moths. So you don't want to be somewhere where there's no bugs. That's, that's a huge red flag. That's like living in a toxic wasteland bubble. Ugh. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Allison, I know, well, maybe you will believe it. You know, we're coming up on being on here today for an hour. Can How fast that goes. I know, us flapping our gums about <laughs> health and wellness topics. So knowing that we are going to come to a conclusion here, uh, is there anything else that, you, you know, we didn't touch on that you think you would might want to share on this yeah, so much. topic? I know, I know. So much. Maybe it's part two. Oh, yes, it is. It is a part two. Cause I think it's, um, you know, it's just, if there's one thing I can leave people with, it's be a little bit more of a critical thinker about the food you eat. You, you know, marketing is a real legit thing. And, um, there's a lot of food laws or lack thereof out there that will have you believing one thing. And it's not the case at all. So, you know, we always hear about being a critical thinker, think for yourself, think intuitively, um, you know, be like that with your food too. You know, if, you, if you're craving something, not like a hot Cheeto or a Snickers, but like, if you feel like you're craving soup for some reason, or, you know, you're, you're craving a nice big flaky crust of bread with some butter, do it. Like there's a reason why, but be methodical about that. You know, get a good bread, get a good butter, not a margarine. And, you know, but, ugh, I could just go on forever, but follow your gut literally and figuratively, you know, be in tune with where your food's coming from and ask questions. It is okay. Like I said, in the beginning, when I was calling, you know, mustard seeds, corporate office, and I was emailing them with questions. And I think like the, um, Black Angus beef or whatever that Bueller sells. And I, I, they're located right here in Wooster is their headquarters. So I had a slew of questions that I shot off to them. And, you know, if they don't want to answer you, then that's a red flag. Absolutely. I mean, no farms, no food, no, no food, no you. So it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to be picky about it. Um, and like you also said somewhere along this last hour about skills and learning new skills, you know, learn how to stock your pantry so that when there's no bread on the shelves, it's no sweat for you because you can make that at home or, you know, learn how to start preserving, freezing, canning, um, every little thing that you can tuck away it might not be enough to get you through until the next season. But between that and the connections that you make, surely something can be figured out. Absolutely. And then yeah. you don't, you awesome. don't have to be in fear. You don't have to live in fear. And when you're not fearful, when you're not living in fear, you're living a whole nother kind of life. Uh, and and that, that is scary for the powers that be because I call it freedom. Always, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that is true freedom. It when is. you can go into the grocery store and you're not panicked because the shelves are beer, bare, um, that is true freedom for it sure. Is. Absolutely. That was a great way to uh, wrap this up today. Yeah, that gave me some goosebumps. I know. I know. We <laughs> take legs are goosebumps. So Alice, where else um, besides this wonderful video series that we're going to continue here for a moment, can people find you? Um, right now I am most instant or active on Instagram. I have an email list as well that you can join when you find me on Instagram, all the infos there are in my bio. Um, but that's just what I'm enjoying right now. You know, I have a love hate relationship with social media and Instagram brings me joy. So whether I'm, you know, gaining followers or not, I don't know, but it's where I like to share my information. And luckily most of the stuff that I'm sharing doesn't have me censored at the moment. I mean, there's going to come a day where they don't want me to tell you how to grow a tomato and, and preserve it for the winter, but for now we're okay. So it's just, um, first name underscore last name. So Allison, A-L-L-I-S-O-N underscore 
P-R-E-I-S-S. And it's pronounced price, which is very confusing. <laughs> well, fantastic. So we're going to post this video. Um, obviously, you're probably seeing it on Rumble or Telegram. Um, I'm going to put in the description box below, if you didn't catch it, ways to catch Allison, some of the books she uh, recommended, and the localharvest.org. Yes. We are also up for um, topics of discussion. Anything you want to uh, send along that maybe you'd like to know more information about, we either have a little bit of knowledge on that, or we really kind of get, we get giddy to do a little research. So yeah. we're up for that. So yeah. uh, again, Allison, thanks. It's been a whole lot of fun today. Yeah. Thank and, you for having um, me anytime. Yeah, perfect. So uh, yeah, everybody, thanks. American Pie, THS, and Allison Price, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, guys.